This is EdTech, episode 66, AV as a Service in Higher Ed. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. This is EdTech, episode 66. Support for AV Nation is brought to you by Extron Electronics. This is EdTech, the monthly higher ed tech podcast. This month, I'm joined by Scott Tyner. Hey, Bill, how are you? I do, how do, sir? And as well, the Amos to my Andy, Mr. Rob Raspberry. How are you, sir? Great. Greetings and misappropriations to you. Indeed. <laughs> so, um, first off, we're going to uh, start off this month's podcast. Uh, it's actually about a uh, article by Mr. Tyner himself, and it's off uh, Rave, Rave Pubs, and that it's uh, AV as a service. It just does not make sense. Now, um, if you read the article and everything, um, if you've you know if you've ever been on a uh, corporate side and everything, AV as a service. If you read it through, it's hey, we'll charge you this much monthly. And you can, you know, as part of a uh, planned upgrade plan, it's kind of like how if Verizon or uh, AT and T and all those folks go and say, "Hey, we'll give, you know, we'll we'll put this in in payment installments, and then you can upgrade at any time." The trouble is, is that just you know you're ending up paying so much that you know it's it's one of those. Well, you can cut the contract at any point. You can't do that with AV as a service, but um, it's one of those things where you're paying for this. And uh, Scott, I'm going to like let you take the reins a little bit with this. And, uh, you know, my big question is, where did folks actually pitch? Like, did, did this, did someone actually pitch this to you as AV as a service, you know, at your school? So um, the reason I wrote this article is that I'm doing a um, panel session here at CCUMC in a couple of weeks uh, with our, our good friend, uh, Gina Sansevero, Susan mm-hmm. Brower. And uh, Nick Folsey, who actually works with Susan Brower. Um, down oh, in- quick thing. Where is CCC- CCUMC going to be this year? Salt Lake City. Ooh. Yeah. Good times. And- uh, I, I believe uh, you'll be bump- bumping into a friend of mine. Uh, J- uh, what was it? Uh, Jim-, Jim Cummings, I believe. He uh, runs stuff for Utah State. But go on. Oh, okay. Great. So we started talking about this panel. I started looking more and more into AV as a service. So nobody actually yet has come and, and pitched it directly to me. But as you look at it, Lots of people in the industry are talking about it. And in this article, I tried to look at it in two ways. One, from my um, perspective as, as a customer, uh, but also from the perspective of the business. And I actually worked with a couple of my guys here. We, we got a classroom. We got all the numbers for it. And we said, okay, what would this look like as an AV as a service? Mm-hmm. Um, we find that there would be no value in, in doing that for us and that we would be paying a lot more than we would up front for a room. Um, one of the things we hear a lot about a, as AV as a service is that it's not a managed service. Mm-hmm. So it's essentially like you described, it's about being able to upgrade whenever you want. Well, that's not a, a demand in, in my school that we we're upgrading every six months. <laughs> oh boy, there's a 4K projector, I need that. Oh, now I need a laser one. Now I need you know better speakers. We have classrooms eight, nine years old that work just fine and do everything that they need to do. Mm -hmm. I also struggled when I looked at it from the business side, which the best I can think of is that businesses, firms are looking for an ongoing revenue stream. And they came up with this. And yet, even with them, I can't figure out how they're making money on essentially loaning you money at a, if they charge an interest rate, I just it, it doesn't make sense. So one of the things in this article, and one of the things I hope for our viewers do, tell me where I'm wrong. Like, tell me what I'm missing. The so that's the thing is that, um, like I said, it, it's it's kind of like the Verizon plan here, um, and you're you're absolutely right on this because um, if you look at some of the practices, um, and this will tie into something a little bit later, but it's it, let's put it this way. You know your your handy dandy phone. I get it. Like you know, I think I'm on the uh, S6 here and everything. We're now up to like I think the Galaxy S10. Uh, you know, I'm probably well overdue for an upgrade, but that's different in that. Yeah, I, I know there's all sorts of upgrades and things like that, but 
you know, when it comes to our faculty and everything, you're not going to get them to be like, oh, cool, just because, hey, look, we got a laser projector. Well, if they're still showing Excel sheets and they're still showing uh, regular PowerPoint slides and everything, yay. <laughs> but th there are certain things that sometimes it's like, oh, that's a good advantage or that's a good um, uh, inclusion. Like, uh, for example, like one of the things I know that's becoming more more common is like certain certain classrooms. The only way I could see this as an improvement is if, say, they said, "Oh, here, uh, we're going to make it to where um, you know, as part of the upgrade, as part of like an AV as a service thing, uh, you know, what? we'll make every classroom uh, we can upgrade all of them to lecture capture uh, ability, which is great." Um, and the other, uh, the, you know, me playing the devil's advocate with that would be. Uh, you know, uh, how do, you know, how do you tell the faculty that it's not recording all the time because, you know, we do get uh, uh, sociology professors that might be a little bit paranoid about what they're saying. Um, but, you know, Rob, like, I'm going to bounce this to you on this one in that, um, you know, is, is it, you know, Scott's, is, is I say, Scott's right about this in that is, you know, always having the newest thing really that necessary in education. It's not talking down on things so much as it's, you know, is shiny and new really that necessary for, for uh, our faculty? Yeah, so I think, you know, this is more something that's going to go in an enterprise or corporate environment simply because they can throw whatever money they have away and everybody is always looking for the, the newest, greatest thing. But in a higher ed space, we're looking to save money and be efficient and have things work and have things work so the instructors can do what they do best, which is teach to the students. So Scott, you're absolutely right. I, this doesn't really have um, a place, I think, in our space, simply because it's not cost effective. Um, and I don't think that there is, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, if there's a higher ed institution that has the ability to financially say, yes, I'm gonna replace this, get the latest, greatest, always upgrade and do this kind of thing. It just doesn't financially make sense. We, as AV, um, uh, people want to do things internally and save money and do it efficiently and service our customers, which are ultimately the students, faculty, administration, as best as possible and be financially and fiscally responsible as well. And this just doesn't do it. It, it really doesn't. If you have the money and you have the toys and you want all the latest and greatest, that's great. But not, not in our space. I don't think there's a place for it. Well, I have to, I have to say, I mean, Rob and Bill, I mean, you both said I'm right, which is a, a first, I think, in my <laughs> life ever that two people have said that in a row. Uh, I think, I, I put this article, I think there's one place where this really would work is, is the home res market, right? Where people want a, a, a predictable monthly payment. They do want the new TV when it comes out. They do want blah, blah, blah when it comes out. So that, make, that makes a lot of sense. The other oh, my AK TV. <laughs> yeah, the other piece for me about it is um, when we talk about upgrading. So, you know, Bill said, oh, what if we came in one year and said, okay, we're going to go all classroom capture. Well, guess what? Your bill's going up when they do that. I mean, that's part of AV. So you're still paying for it. I just, I really still struggle with um, the concept. And I feel like it's um, firms trying to get this ongoing revenue stream and they just haven't hit the value for me. It's, it's, it's one of those things where now, you know, and you've mentioned it in the article and everything, software as a service is viable because, you know, case in point is this, uh, you know, uh, across our campus, uh, we have the Adobe uh, Creative uh, Suite, which, you know, is, if you're not familiar with it, it's Photoshop, it's Illustrator, it's InDesign, it's After Effects, it's Premiere, uh, it's the whole thing. And it's an enterprise, you know, they just literally went and gave us an enterprise key and they said, here you go, it costs this much a year, uh, you can install it on how many, whatever, but it's a subscription service. So, you know, it, as, long as, as long as the hardware, the hardware ends meet it, go nuts, here you go. We don't, you know, we're perfectly fine with this. Um, certain, uh, certain manufacturers are already kind of going to a subscription type service. Um, if you've, you know, just a, just a quick thing here, Rob and Scott, um, if for you guys to do wireless, do you guys do any wireless collaboration on campus or it's, or you guys are still kind of 
mess around. Still, see it's sort one. of in the infancy. I mean, okay. we have some solstice. We're looking at uh, Synapse very closely. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just starting to get into that wireless collaboration space. Okay, Scott? Yeah, we do, um, not really. We do some wireless presentation, mm -hmm. but not really the uh, collaboration. Okay, so um, just recently we, we finally fixed this on campus. Uh, we have about, on our campus, we have about 40 or so uh, solstice pods. And um, one of the big things that uh, Mersive has done is, uh, you know, they're constantly updating all their software and everything, and they're pushing certain things. There's some new stuff that's coming along. I go, that's really cool. Um, but from their big perspective is they looked at it and said, hey, if you want all the software updates, um, that's a uh, annual um, warranty. Now, you know, we, we eventually got them to do a big co-termed uh, warranty and everything. And now all our stuff is set to expire in 2021, which by that time, um, I'm sure there'll be some far more powerful hardware that's come along. Um, but for them, I can see it's that's Mercer's way of saying, yes, this is how we're going to keep uh, the money coming in and everything is kind of through a subscription slash warranty service and everything. Um, that makes sense. That I don't really have a huge issue with because, you know, how often does how often does Apple decide to update their iOS or OS X stuff and all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, hey, this doesn't work now. Oh, yeah, we'll work on that. Um, so it, that as a service is understandable, but circling back to everything av as a service yeah uh there there has to be some some more uh, uh there has to be a kind of a better bang for the buck uh next up on our articles this is from uh campustechnology.com and it was a survey in which they went over about how you know if you look through the whole thing, um, there's a couple of surveys. The big one of the biggest one was the impact of technology on the respondents, or in this case, the uh, um, the students' uh, job and everything, or the teacher's job. And they said 44% of it has made their life easier. Now, the other portion that seems a little kind of disturbing is that about one in five have said it's actually made their life harder. Now. How does this relate to everything? Well, uh, I've been kind of throwing around this idea and kind of talked it over with some folks. And at a number of colleges, there is a baseline of digital literacy for the students. It's like, hey, you know, if you're coming to this school, you have to at least know this much or at least be this competent with things. So on the flip side, I want to ask you, Scott, I want to ask you and Rob in that, when it comes to your faculty and when it comes to your staff, you know, across the campus, is there a baseline or is there a certain level of kind of assumption that, you know, you're, you're like, you look and you and say, yeah, this should be, you know, this, like a room like this should require minimal training or no training, like folks should be able to go and, and go off the bat and, and go to it. Um, it. And on the other level, it's the, or do you just like, you know, every now and then you'll look at a trouble ticket and go and say, oh, all right, this is the, the okay, there's going to be some training with this. There's going to be a session. But for you guys, like, what's the, you know, what's the minimum level that you guys tend to, to look at, or at least look at how the room's designed versus what you assume the folks are going to know? Uh, if you're starting with me, we, we design a classroom with the intent uh, that it will require no training. Okay. Um, that we think that the, the fact that they're here have been trained on rooms years ago. We try to stick with consistent programming as new faculty come in, they've been exposed to it through po post-grad programs or in graduate school. Um, so they, they, they know there's a touch panel in the room and they walk in, they, they hit it and they use it. Um, I'm curious when, when I read this article, it, it, it's interesting to me. I, I want to um, just keep digging more and more into it because um, it, it surveyed faculty and they said it made their job harder, which I'm, I'm curious how much of that relates to AV and how much of that relates to just technology. And I don't like putting my grades in on a website when yeah. I used to be able to write on a piece of paper and, and send it via campus mail to the registrar. <laughs> yeah. so there, there's, that, there's that struggle with, with it for me. I, the other one I'm, I'm surprised at um, that they didn't qu quite ask or maybe they didn't write about is, uh, I could understand if faculty said that it makes my job more frustrating and I completely get that piece when you walk into a room and 
just something doesn't work, right? We all have jobs because stuff doesn't work all the time. And so there's that frustrating piece about it that I get, that I rely on this very much. When I walk in there and it doesn't work, um, that's very frustrating. And that's where we focus our time is that we have, we have this uh, call button on a touch panel. They press that button and we were a small campus. So I'm to tell you 90% of the time we have a staff member there in three minutes mm -hmm. um, to, get, to, to do some work with, with that faculty member and get them up and running. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I'll just point out in case anybody's reading this article and one of the comments pointed it out, uh, 161 faculty members, um, <laughs> they should, I was hoping they would have polled a few more than that. Yeah, that is a, that is a <laughs> very small pool. I will, I will admit to that up front. Um, now the other portion that in, you know, this is the, this is the, you're right about this. The, the, the vocab of this is, is a little vague in the fact that they go, Oh, technology. Now, uh, one of the things that we have here and you guys probably both have it there at your campuses is, um, the wonderful realm of, uh, like either survey monkey or uh, turning point and things like that. And it's always an interesting, like that, that I could guarantee it's, it's a good thing for getting feedback, but getting the folks used to it. Oh, I could get, almost guarantee you that the part of like a good chunk of that percentage of, Oh, it's frustrating is yeah. Getting the feedback because uh, you know, you have to either with turning point, there's, you know, they still have like the physical, they still at campuses, mine included. So they still have like the physical clickers, mm -hmm. but you know, if you go to a larger scale school, like at Rob, at Rob school, it would not surprise me if it's, you know, Oh yeah, no, we have the cloud-based version. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, trying to corral, you know, a hundred plus students in a lecture hall. Okay, guys, download this app. Uh, it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's going to go into the ether. Um, yeah. So that I can, that to a certain degree, I could kind of see as, as kind of vexing slash, you know, I just want this to work. I just want to get my, just want to get the feedback from the students. And, you know, it's, it's the, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? And, yeah, that's the part that I can see as being frustrating. Rob, like, um, as, as I say, for you, what have been some of the uh, some of the faculty frustrations or at least some of the stuff that you guys have implemented and they go, that's cool, but, you know, oh, like, it, what was one of those things that seemed like a good idea at the time and then the actual implementation? <laughs> uh, believe it or not, smart boards seem to have a big <laughs> learning curve. Yes. Yes, I, well, put, I put what here? Oh, wait. I'm using a permanent marker on the board. Wait, oh, wait, that's not the right one. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. And with a sign clearly there that says that. It, it, it's so funny that, you know, we're, we're talking about this because I think if this was like maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, you know, our attitude would be more pro, proactive. Mm -hmm. In other words, we would reach out to more because the technology became newer. When things were instituted, it was a much bigger staff. And so we would go out of our way to say, which instructors does a department feel need some training and you know, bring them in and take them through the new touch panels and things of this sort. Well, whereas now, since things like a touch panel and things of this sort, Scott, like you said, you sort of assume that the faculty have had some training with it. And so what you get into is more a reactive situation where if something's wrong in a classroom or an instructor just doesn't quite understand what's going on, you spend some time with them. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it doesn't happen as much. Now, here's the other thing. You know, we talk about our LMSs as an example, when you talk about technology, that sometimes is where you see where faculty get a little more frustrated because there's more things they have to do with their course shells and, and do grades and, and do all these things, um, you know, in the cloud or with Blackboard or Moodle or whatever. And a Sakai, and they can get <laughs> to that. So, you know, I don't think it's necessarily as much on the, I'm going to say as much on the AV or classroom side as is where it's technology across the board. You have your instructors that they embrace it, they absorb it, they live in it, that's what they do, and other ones don't want to have anything to do with it. It's a struggle for them to turn the power on button, or it's a struggle for them to even plug in, you know, their machine into an outlet, just things of that sort. Yeah, so, it's the, well, I was going to tell you that, I was going to ask you this, 
and this is for both of you guys. Um, we have like a, you know, a kind of a newer generation of faculty that are coming in and they're used to uh, iPads. They're used to working with a GUI. They're, they're used to going like, yeah, yeah, no, I just, I use the apps or I do this. Yeah, I'm used to it. And then you have, um, you know, they're like digital natives. They grew up with this stuff. It's second nature to them. And then you still have faculty who are kind of digital immigrants. They had to learn all this. They had to like add this as well as, you know, whatever research slash doctoral work they're doing. Um, what's been more of the mix for you guys? Has it been more of like the newer faculty or just like, yeah, no, I get this. Or it's the, uh, I'm going to go with who moved my cheese uh, level of folks. Um, I think for, for my institution, what we find is that, and, and it ties into what Rob was saying, the the fact that you've been here for a while can still walk into a classroom and pick up a piece of chalk and write on the board. We're not making them use technology. But if you start looking at an LMS or if you start looking at a grading system or any kind of administrative system, they are being made to use that. So what we find is that the newer faculty, the digital nativeness almost hurts them in a sense that they, and I know we've all seen this, they walk in saying, blah, 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 works at my house just fine, and I want to use it here in the classroom. <laughs> and then you got to start jumping through hoops to do it, and they get very frustrated because why is this so hard to use here? Why are you making this so difficult for me? Um, whereas uh, um, faculty who have been around for a while are just like, I'm, I've been writing on the board for 20 years, and I've, I've, I've graduated some pretty intelligent people. Uh, and I agree with them, right? And so that, that's what they're going to keep doing. And I think that might be what we're talking about, because the other piece about this survey that they noted at the bottom is that 60% of those respondents um, have been in the industry for more than 21 years. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about some people who have um, some experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, on, the, on that same note, uh, I would actually mention that um, there are certain things where it's like you want to update some of the traditional things versus, you know, like you said, you have uh, faculty who have been writing on the board. The reverse of that is there are times where some of the traditional stuff can actually make things seem dated and hurt you. Uh, case in point, thank God, I can actually say this finally now, uh, with the exception of our math department, <laughs> the rest of our campus has gotten away from blackboards, Whole, like, or sorry, chalkboards. Holy crap. Wow. Well, Good think, think, think of it this way. I get it. There are some traditional medias. Why glass boards have suddenly fallen under my purview, I'll never know. But at the same time, it's one of those things that makes – it does kind of update and it does – it's – well, it's either that or else, you know, I'm going to be having my – I'm going to be having my student staff running around with flip charts. Anyone who's worked in corporate for a while knows, knows the joys of that and easels, but moving on. Um, there are certain things that, that from a perspective, yeah, you have to still maintain certain – traditional elements for the, for your faculty um, while at the same time saying, Hey, you know, if you do this, uh, listen, I'm just going to keep it as this as tech managers. It is our job to provide our, I think our faculty with tools that allow our faculty to do it, like just give them every option to do things. Now, whether or not they do it, that's on them. And more importantly, I think, the bigger push with that stuff actually comes normally from say the provost office or the, you know, the Dean's office and things like that. Uh, case in point, a good case in point is this. Um, if you guys ever look at university of Maryland for every physical course they have, they have an online counterpart. Now, does that, you know, does that demean anything or make things, uh, you know, make it like a diploma mill or anything? Certainly not. Um, I think it does also make it so that, the faculty actually have to be a bit more competent and a bit more kind of up to date with things. You know, it's one of those, you know, Oh, you're going to just do everything on the board. All right. Well, you know, we're going to at least shoot a, you know, shoot a, a PTZ camera in the corner and uh, mic you up and everything. But that's a push from university of Maryland because they're trying to, you know, up their student, their uh, student uh, attendance count and everything. That's my soapbox. I will, I will jump down off of that. Uh, Rob, <laughs> I will just keep it to this. Rob, uh, with yeah. your with, with as I say with your campus, you guys have more of a um, you know like I said, what's the mix? Is it more? Is it like are most of your faculty already kind of acclimated to the touch screens or keypads and everything? 
And you don't have yeah, it seems to be the case. Yeah, most of them are, are are pretty familiar, and especially obviously the new faculty that come in seem to be uh, more acclimated to that kind of thing. And really, in general, you know, there's I'm going to say that with higher tech colleges and classroom spaces on campus, they all have touch panels. So it's just something that the faculty in general are used to. Now, the intricacies of that or what is, you know, in a space, that can uh, cause a bit of a learning curve. But in general, like I said, you try to make it as uniform and as easy as possible, you know, it, you know, as, as close as you can get to one button just turns everything on and you just go and plug and play. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to make it as easy as possible for the faculty to do their job. Um, but there's always, you know, a few that do not embrace it and need hand holding. And even when you hold the one hand, you have to hold the other hand. Um, so th that's always going to be there and you always have to accommodate that. Oh, yeah. My, my personal fave is uh, we actually had a history uh, professor who came in. And he went, oh, yeah, I want to present stuff in an active learning classroom. We're like, sure, by all means, let's go. Cool. And he's like, oh, I also brought my laptop. Okay, cool. So we bring it over. And he's running a laptop that still had Windows XP. <laughs> and it was VGA. Yeah, yeah, believe me. Even, even I looked at this and went, well, thank God we haven't gotten rid of VGA. But, uh, oh, boy. Um, yeah, it, it, it was uh, something special. And uh, eventually, we just kind of told them, like, dude, just, just put it on, the, put it on, the, on the, the network drive. Just upload your stuff from there. Log in. It'll be a lot smoother, we promise. But it, it's one of those, you know, the faculty member looks and goes, remember, I have a doctorate. I go, uh-huh. <laughs> I, I have, and I have a, a bachelor's and 26 other certifications, which, at least in my mind, puts me at a master's plus. <laughs> <laughs> I have a Remember, I have a doctorate, right? And that's why I'm here helping you. <laughs> yes. You have a doctorate. You just say, congrats. You have a doctorate. Good for you. I'm not taking your class. No. Um, anyways, that's about all the time we have. Uh, gentlemen, where can the fine folks find you online? Uh, you can find me on, on Twitter at S. Tyner or uh, on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And uh, can the folks find, uh, as I say, what dates are the uh, CCUMC conference going to be this year? Oh, uh, geez, she cut me a tiny, tiny bit off for you. It is October, I believe it's 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Ah. So it's okay. coming right up. Ah, very good. Uh, and you'll be there with uh, Miss San Severo, which will be fun. Yes. Um, if you've, if folks, if you've never attended, uh, CCUMC is a great uh, tech manager uh, meeting as well as, uh, you know, you have tech managers, you have CIOs, you have manufacturers, and just everyone's there to kind of collaborate and talk and you get to tour some actually pretty impressive campuses. Um, Scott, like in the previous years, it's been what Portland and I believe Pittsburgh. Uh, there was one in uh, Notre Dame last year. The year ah, before right. that was uh, San Antonio. I oh, do yeah. think there was one in Pittsburgh recently. It's actually one of my favorite conferences. It, it's, it's big enough that you get to see some other people, but it's small enough that you get to talk to everyone. Fair enough. And Mr. Raspberry, where can the fine folks find you at? LinkedIn, Rob Raspberry, uh, always, you know, Drexel.edu. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have two teams, uh, video collaboration and production and instructional media services, so just look me up. Fair enough. I'm not going to say Google me, but, you know. No, no, I, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Folks can find me on uh, LinkedIn and, uh, of course, ver across various medias, and I'll keep it to that. Um, that's all the time we have. I will see you guys next month. You've been listening, as I say, and once again, this has been EdTech, podcast on AV Nation. Thank you very much.